Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I speak with Brian Cote Noir, practicing alchemist and author of Alchemy, Poetry of Matter, and the recently published Practical Alchemy, A Guide to the Great Work. Brian discusses alchemy as the perfection of nature. He also talks about alchemical symbols, his translation of the alchemical text, the Emerald Tablet, alchemical cosmology, his concept of sur reason, which is a different way of knowing, and finally, the need for secrecy in the alchemical arts. Brian Cote Noir is an alchemist, artist, publisher, and award winning filmmaker. He is author of the recent republication of Practical Alchemy, Guide to the Great Work, and the 2017 work, Alchemy, the Poetry of Matter. He is also author of a series of alchemical zines, alchemical meditations, and the Emerald Tablet, his translation of and commentary on the earliest Arabic and Latin versions of this seminal alchemical text. He has presented seminars and workshops around the world on various aspects of alchemy. Brian, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thanks. I'm gl- glad to be here, Nick. Yes, well, I'm happy to have you here. Uh, as I <laughs> mentioned to you before we hit record, it's not every day that one gets to speak with a practicing alchemist. Right. Uh, right. So I'm looking forward to Well, actually, to you this. might be surprised. <laughs> you might be speaking to more than you know, right? That could or be. Or people doing, you know, to stretch a metaphor, but it's actually perhaps not a metaphor. Sometimes people are actually engaged in alchemical processes even though the material might be different mm-hmm. you know so there yeah he is there yeah well i know uh, the first question i have for you is what is alchemy and i wanted to preface this and i think this is relevant to what you were just saying is that you know i know personally the first time i ever came across alchemy was when i was in high school in a chemistry class Right. And it was just mentioned that it was a precursor to chemistry. Mm-hmm. They were trying to turn lead into gold and it was an absolute failure. Right. And I think I saw some of the wood uh, carvings, uh, the sure, uh, like chemical the, imprints, right? Right, right. The um, engravings, etchings. Yeah, the engravings. The illustrations, yeah. Yeah. And then as I began to explore Carl Jung, of course, you know, mm-hmm. uh, alchemy is important. And in my graduate program, there's always talk about alchemy and the alchemical process. And I've noticed that now it often seems to be used as a kind of an adjective, you know, people say, well, this is alchemical, Mm -hmm. but I always wonder, you know, what they mean by that. And if it is really connected to the ancient art of alchemy. So I wanted to ask again you know what is alchemy and okay. what do you mean by it okay I, I i i think i can help unpack some of that at least get a uh, ground that we could talk about or any everybody can kind of think about so i've for folks who aren't familiar with i mean thank you for a very very lovely introduction but just to just to, to expand on it just a little bit is that i actually will do experimental work Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that, it's not that I'm like, oh, I am in here doing all sorts of things, attempting to change lead into gold. It's more that I'm investigating and questioning the early primary sources and what their views on it are. And then trying to come up with or understand what they were doing and then replicate it. And then from there, get an insight into, because once you do it, they may be speaking it in a way you end up with a result that does match pretty well kind of what they're talking about. Falls apart a little later on, but you feel, okay, I I, I figured something out here. And then you try to keep on going. And so, um, so that's what I, that's, that's the work I, that's the work I do. But my focus and interest in it is this aspect of alchemy where it discusses both inner processes and outer processes. And so this is where I will uh, give like a very general definition of alchemy. It's one I 
if anybody's ever been to a talk of mine or something, they've heard this a dozen times, thousands of times. But so how I how I define, and this comes from from the work I've done reading texts, and it, it's a, it's a, a modification on something a Swiss alchemist Paracelsus had said. And basically, how I define it is that alchemy is the art and science of bringing something to its final perfection. Okay, so. There's a lot of terms there that need to get defined, but you can you can basically fill in anything in those slots as to what that thing is, what that art is, what that science is, and what that perfection is. But what it implies is that there is this sort of a realm of rawness to a well realm of doneness, you know, mm. uh, something that's imperfect brought to perfection. So what that would mean, like in the definition, like you had mentioned, oh, lead into gold. Right uh, in natural philosophy, up until you know 17th century, really, um, it was viewed that the metals are all one thing, just on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. Right, that there's this root called mercury, and how it interacts with sulfur uh, in the earth, what planetary influences, uh, what the quality of the the matrix the earth was, would determine. Would it be lead? Would it be tin? Would it be copper? Would it be iron? Would it be silver or gold? The more balanced those elements were, the more perfect the metal was. So that's what an alchemist would do, right? You would dig into the earth, find a metal at its certain state and go, okay, I will bring it to its final perfection. If you think of it in terms of um, sort of the Western traditions of religion and spirituality, the idea of ascent to the one uh, union with God, the, uh, the, these ideas implied within alchemy also because that thing can be the soul. So it's the process of bringing that soul through these stages to its own perfection, whatever that might be defined as. And then the idea of perfection has in it um, ideas of something being finished, being done, being completed. Right? It's the perfect tense in, in language, right? It's, it's done over with back then. Um, and it's also the idea of, you know, it's not how we often use it. It's perfect. Hmm. You know, it's like you don't want to do anymore. And then if you think about it in the creative sense, um, it is actually one of the harder stages in the arts is to know when you are done. You know, if you're painting, it, it, you know, you go like, okay, just what? No, because you take that one more step, you just destroyed it. One stroke will destroy the whole thing. Mm. So it's this balance of, okay, what do we mean by this? And then the art and the science is just that. It's like medicine in a sense. You use both of these um, ways of engaging the world, scientific and artistic, right? medicine in the sense of clinical experience. You know, I've seen many of these things, even though, you know, evidence-based practice says statistically and the science says you do this in these cases. However, case comes to you and you go, it's not quite fitting, but from my experience. So it's this kind of an idea that you use all ways of knowing, intuitive, all these types of things. And then it's tested in the world. And that's the thing with alcohol. Okay. Like you can say all this stuff, but then there's a 17th century uh, Latin phrase, uh, peregnia, by fire. You said you made this. Let me have some. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about peer review. That's the idea. It's mm -hmm. that you, there's, no, there's no bullshitting here. Right. Um, and so that is how that over the years of like study research and work and then you can you you know not everybody is doing all of that in their particular area of practice sometimes it is just a more of a material investigation of you know of how metals do what and that evolves into physics you know uh how this actually you do that ends up making porcelain but only if you use well that starts to edge into chemistry Right, because those questions are becoming much more interesting and much more rewarding, you know, financially and all these other things than trying to get that piece of metal to look to be like that piece of metal. You know, not not as I like to say, not with vinegar and um, you know, 
salt. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. The concepts are there. Right. Right. Where like it becomes, you know, kind of things build up into larger structures and our experience is that, you know, we call them atoms, subatomic particles, these types of things. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea of taking what's underneath, recombining, rearranging would, would have a surface effect. And that's, I mean, Newton was the first uh, physicist, last alchemist, and right. Robert Boyle was the last alchemist and first chemist. Yeah, and uh, Newton was far more interested in alchemy, wasn't he? Oh, his his the majority of his writings are alchemical, I believe. I think yeah. I think it's either the first or the second. The second is his uh, anti-trinitarian writings, mm. where were his writings in theology, which it's I don't know. I think about this. Uh, you, if you if I, if do some reading or watch a good documentary on Newton. The right. guy's a piece of work. Yeah. <laughs> be like, I can't imagine him having a job anywhere today. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like he is so, he's just so wrong on so many ways as a human being. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When you read his biography, like auto, like not his auto, but it's like what his biographers have to say about him. It's just like, yeah, just go, you know, good for the play gears. Good you stayed in your room. Glad you worked out the math. <laughs> you know, just stay away from, from the people. It's a, yeah, so, so, so he never got to that perfection stage. No, no, no. In a certain, in a, in a certain level, yes. But, um, but wow. I, I'm just sorry. It, it just, every time I think about it, it, it just, mm. you know, he was really not a nice person. I mean, it really comes right down to that. It, it was yeah. just uh, mean. One of my just as a little, you can do what you want with this. Uh, was that you, like he invented calculus, right? Which to me is just like, wow, somebody invented a whole new mathematics, right? Well, so did Leibniz, mm -hmm. who was a, another mathematician, and he invented calculus at the same time. So this was put before the Royal Society. And it was to be determined who actually uh, should be awarded this. And it was going to be the head of that society that would decide it. Well, the head of that society was Isaac Newton. So yeah, guess who got yeah. it? Yeah. So sure. I mean, that's not nasty. That's just, you know, ego and self-preservation. Right. You know, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Interesting. But anyhow, but yes, that was the majority of his writing. And he approached this very seriously and very scientifically and wanted it to be real. I mean, because there's a lot in Newton's uh, alchemical work that you do start to see what he was, and you see it in his optics. Um, it's uh, what he was doing like macrocosmically in terms of physics, his attention was starting to go towards like, well, okay, what's going on, on down in there? And it's like in the second part of his optics, it's almost all alchemical. Um, this type of thing. So, uh, so yeah, it, it's at that point where you have somebody that's really wanting this to be true, pushing it, but then finding better answers going this way, and then just kind of puts that aside and continues going. And it's not until a few hundred years later that we are actually transmuting, you know, metals into other things, you know, right. Um, but the con, as I say, the, the theory and the concept is there. Yeah. You know? Can, can anyone truly achieve perfection or is it something that is define kind of it ongoing low you know? <laughs> define it low enough yeah yeah, yeah well <laughs> yeah uh, but is that but is that perfection you know well uh, uh, this is this yeah. is uh, what do we mean by that? exactly right, this, is, right. this is this is all to, in my mind mm -hmm. this is all part of it mm -hmm. this is all where um where where the alchemy does become the science, but it also becomes the philosophy, which also edges into a theology, not theology, but a spirituality, right? A, a right. philosophy of action that is the intent of kind of making you a better human being, right? Mm -hmm. So when the right. like you die in this world, so you don't you know bad shit don't happen later. Yeah, <laughs> basically is the idea. Right, right. So it does open up into that. Um, you've said a lot of things that I want to touch upon. And I think that one of the places I want to begin, and this is sort of where I am currently, it's what's on my mind, but it was your comment that alchemy takes different ways of knowing. Oh, yeah. 
uh, this idea of different ways of knowing. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot uh, because, you know, I, I teach religious studies. I've got my backgrounds mm-hmm. in religious studies. Mm-hmm. And now I'm doing this podcast on spirituality and esoteric and everything. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I share some of this in social media. And there's always this sort of backlash from rationalists who immediately equate uh, spirituality with religion and nonsense. Mm-hmm. And okay. in <laughs> your, uh, well, in the uh, Poetry of Matter book, mm-hmm. you discuss this and you come up with this term. Uh, I don't know if it's your term that you coined or you got it somewhere else, but it was Sir Reason. Yeah, I, um, I kind of made it up. Maybe others yeah. have used it. I'm not claiming to be unique. You know yeah. what I mean? But yeah, well, it's the only word I could kind of come up with that I was trying to grasp at it's not just a form of intuition right yeah well I really like that because you know reason is important and it helps us and we can't get by without reason but yet there are these different ways of knowing you know intuition is important um you know, feeling is important and sure. symbolic knowledge is important and right. it's not inherently irrational. And so I exactly. like, so I exactly. like that you gave that, that, that sort of third way of looking right. at things. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's really it. You, you, with alchemy and my reading and study of it, it's, it, there's just a lot, <laughs> there's a whole lot going on. And either conscious strategies of communication, of working with image and text to kind of suggest things in between. Um, Some of it does seem very conscious in the sense of, like I'm doing this workshop on uh, Splendor Solis, which is this magnificent uh, 16th century manuscript. I don't want to call them miniatures because they're not miniature, but fulls page. And if if you've seen them, you've seen them. They're, 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 They're striking. But there's a way they work with the image where it has a, you can go, okay, there are the colors that signify processes in alchemy. There's something here that process, this is an alchemy. But then you realize it's actually a quote or illustrating a quote from a myth. Mm. And that if you go and look up what that myth is talking about, it's about entering the underworld and returning from the underworld. How do you do that, right? So here's what I'm saying is that I can't prove this, but yet when the whole book is doing that, right? Each time you go and you see a certain, and it's a reference, it's usually something about going to or coming from the underworld, right? So you say, okay, well, maybe there's something going on in this book that's speaking about uh, the inner life or our own underworld. But it's the way it does it. If one were to approach this as encoding or a hyper, like a rational way of, oh, here is text, here is image, and this is illustrating text, and text is elucidating image, it really doesn't quite work that way. Here's like, it, it's kind of related, to, but here's a way I kind of illustrate it in terms of sort of like art, science, reason, what have you. And it's this idea of a stereograph. And I, I think I mentioned this in the book as well. Uh, An stereogram is an image when looked at with both eyes and put together, it appears as a 3D image. So you can describe an alchemy has often been described as, well, it's about the physical world. It's about changing lead into gold, making transformations, working with salts, coming up with really good stuff that we can use. There's another view of it that says, well, no, it's actually um, all analogy, more metaphor for the perfection of the soul uh, and, and all these things. And you read the literature and you could read it, you go, yeah, this is about changing metals and doing that, right? And then you could read the text, they go, well, no, it's all metaphor. And then you read it and you go, oh, I can understand that, right? So both those texts are kind of correct in their own way in that own reading, much like two images in a stereogram. If you look at one and you go, that's about, you know, Oh, a dog in a field with kids playing in the background with, you know, what have you. And then you look at the left one and it's not much different, really. Would you go, but it's saying it's about, and you go, okay. But when you put those two images together, right? It's a whole nother experience. It's a whole nother experience you can't quite describe to someone who is only one eye. Um, it's this idea of, of, of 3D vision that all of a sudden, 
There's more information there. There's more to be said about it. There's more to be experienced there. And so my question always is, is then, okay, which eye is more important? You know, which eye are you going to? And my idea of like a kind of a surreal, a sur reason is that that's the process that kind of gets you there, right? And then what you're perceiving is that perception that you get from bringing all these ways of knowing together because you want that rational, you want that scientific, you want that, you know, kind of like logical kind of working. That's sort of like your a matrix in a way, a framework that you can sort of stand on uh, while you stand away from it to take it apart, sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I, it's, and that's the idea. And, and in reading, um, and this isn't like this idea of like all ways of knowing is what you do. This is a seventh century alchemical philosophy. It's called Way of the Philosophers. Uh, Stephanus of Alexandria writes about it. It's like what you do is you take every perspective you can take, right? And then what you do is, uh, he doesn't say it quite like this. It's like you try to find, you try to resolve the contradictions and find the luminous center, mm -hmm. right? But you can only do that if you take, take everything, you know, mm -hmm. all the perspectives and then kind of try to work with it that way. And that's what I feel like a real full sense of alchemy was, right? Mm. Um, in its fullest, biggest, most kind of, you know, practice in its best way in all aspects of it. And you see that from time to time in some writings, um, mm. particularly in the early work, some of the Greco-Roman, some of the Islamic, where it's like, there's a practical, but it's very mystical at the same time. And mm -hmm. you know, they're really doing stuff, you know, and a lot of it is based around medicine also, literal medicine. Right. Uh, with a lot of the Sufi work, um, it was about, like Jabba Ibn Hayyan, it is, it, it is about medicine. It, mm -hmm. Some of it is almost just like purely like chemistry. Mm -hmm. But in that sense of, you know, exploring the creator's creation, I understand and get closer to the creator. That's yes. all good. Right. right? It, it didn't have that Western kind of curse of like, well, you know, you don't want to know too much kind of a thing because, you know, devil's right. going to trick you, yeah. you know, so best to kind of, you know, just hands off, you know, step mm -hmm. away. Whereas this is a tradition that was like, no, you know, knowledge, this is a, this is a, this is a gift from God, you know, mm -hmm. that we have, we right. must use that then to its nth degree, you know. And so this is where you see these these all ways of kind of like bringing knowledge in right? or investigating or questioning. You know? And that can be artistic and poetic, mythic, you know? It's like one of the examples I give, it's like other, and it's, it's kind of a sort of a neurological mechanical one, I guess. But it, it's, it's like, I'll ask somebody, there's a cup and there's a rather like a box that, you know, and here it's kind of the giveaway is obviously the cup will fit it, right? And if I were to say, you know, will that cup fit in the box? You'll look at it, you'll look at it, you'll go, yes. And then I say, how do you know? Right? It's not like you took measurements. It's not like you, and it has to do with our experience in the past and how we stored it and this is experiential knowledge stored up and built up. But yet there's also this visual thing of a size assessment and distance close. It's, these are all sort of like in here, many ways of knowing. So it's kind of right. a material metaphor for that, but it's very much like that, you know, yeah. of, you know, all of it. Yeah, it's, you know, it comes to mind uh, with what you were just saying, um, and I'll move on from this in a moment, but it is this idea, I, you know, I come across this a lot, uh, you know, with students, and I look at it at myself, too. And of course, strangers on social media, is that there's this tendency to just view everything from one sort of worldview. Yes. And anything that doesn't fit into that worldview, you just reject automatically. Right. And it seems to me based on what you were just saying is that, you know, we have to expand this worldview in mm -hmm. order to achieve transformation, because if all we're doing is going around with these, you know, worldviews that blocks out any other ideas, there is no room at all for yeah. transformation. 
right yeah essentially exactly yeah. It. It, it, yeah. it it's like i don't know you just i mean this is also something i've come to through my kind of creative work in film or mm -hmm. working or even not even i will <laughs> i'm putting too fine a, a shine on it calling it creative work in film yeah. just even like television like working on a show for you know say i don't want to give any name but just like a television thing right not the highest end of what have you but there is this kind of um between the editor producer what the client wants what the intermediary and then even like the the assistant at some point everybody's got different points of view on it and you kind of want to hear from them mm -hmm. And this is where all of a sudden something you were thinking was so clear, all of a sudden someone goes, I don't get that. And it's like, what do you mean you don't get that? It's obvious. And then you look back at it, you go, oh no, it's obvious to me because I know what it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean? And I yeah. fill in the blanks, but you didn't. Mm -hmm. And you get these perspectives on stuff that just, it's a better way of moving. It's a better way of kind of, if you're involved in a creative work that's collective, you know, more eyes on it not always the best as long as you got someone who has a strong point of view who's like kind of guiding the ship so to speak but you really want to hear from like how everybody is seeing and understanding something it just makes yeah. things stronger yeah so that as an analogy it's that same idea um you know the more views you have on something and it's not like you're trying to show that i mean think of the idea of the wolf right and then you go wolf all right and then you then okay it really is an animal first of all right and then you go all right well let me learn all i can about what that animal the wolf is and then you go okay well what are some of the myths what are the other animals that depend and you start taking it from all directions and this is really what it's about mm -hmm. and whereas one may say one thing all of a sudden it, it's a it's a that idea of that fusion of all these elements into this deeper 3d sort of perception right right and it's not like, oh, that's wrong and that's right. It's like, and it's not like, oh, well, everything is right. You know, it's not, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. There's this kind of a fuzzy center where you get like all these perspectives are contributing mm -hmm. to it. You know, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Well, I think so. I mean, you know, what it brings to mind are a couple of things. Uh, one is the power of symbols. You yes. know, the, the wolf is a symbol. And it seems to me that sometimes we have lost our symbolic or many people have lost their symbolic imagination uh, mm -hmm. that there's this kind of literalness, you know, sort right. of like this idea that, well, the alchemists were just trying to turn lead into gold and right. that completely misses so much. And it does. And it misses. I mean, when you look at this alchemical artwork, it is clear that it's not just about turning lead into gold you know right. there's something right. going on there and right. it's mysterious and yeah. uh brings up all sorts of emotions and whatnot mm -hmm. exactly. um and so and i wanted to ask you about the the sort of role of symbols in alchemy mm -hmm. and uh some other things but um the other thing I'll get to, we'll come back to this, uh, but I'm just going to say it now so I don't forget it, sure. is the, uh, with what you were just saying, is this idea of interconnection. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, at so, the heart, that's at the yeah. heart of like the, the alchemical theory is yeah. this idea of everything is interconnected. Yeah, but we well, can dig back into that uh, if you yeah. want to follow up on what you wanted to go with first. Well, we can. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'll just I'll say that um, we'll either come back to symbols or come back to the wolves and interconnection. But one of the things that comes to my mind with wolves are a couple of things. But mm -hmm. one is uh, there's this amazing video. It's a very short video that I have students watch sometimes. Uh, and uh, we watch it in conjunction with, I have them read uh, from Aldo Leopold, Thinking Like a Mountain, mm -hmm. where he describes where he's in New Mexico as a young man, and they're just killing all the wolves right. um, because right. they saw that wolves were bad. Sure. And he describes killing this uh, wolf. And when he gets down, uh, he sees the wolf as, as it's dying. Right. And he said, he describes seeing this and this is kind of alchemical, a fierce green fire dying uh -huh. in the wolf's eyes. Yeah. Right. Yes. And he realizes that I think his line is that, you know, the, the, the mountain knows things that we don't. Mm -hmm. 
And the short video I have students watch in conjunction with that is uh, how wolves change rivers. And it was about I've the- I've read about this. Yeah, it's how the wolves were, I think it was Yellowstone, that they were reintroduced to Yellowstone. Right. And it completely changed the ecosystem and to such an extent that it changed right. Right. the flowing of the river. And right. it had to do with the deer- eating yeah. green yeah. and that they were yeah. afraid to eat as much or something yeah. like that. So they were very quick in what they did mm -hmm. and they kind mm -hmm. of grew and then it shifted. It's yeah. amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And you don't yeah. even, there's another thing like that, that has the same kind of, this is a more twisted one. Um, it was like when bike sharing, right. Started in Amsterdam, right. This is like, I don't know what, 20, 30 years ago or so all the bicycles were started to be found in the canals and they couldn't figure out. And it wasn't just like one, it wasn't two, it seemed to be a concerted effort to get, <laughs> to get rid of the bicycles. Hmm. And the city government was like, who, who, who doesn't want this? Like, you know, it was like hard press. And who it turned out to be was the people who were in the business of stealing bicycles refinishing them and then reselling them. Mm. And so by the process of having these kind of free and open bicycles, there were, in, and it was a side effect that nobody was really expecting. It's like, you're thinking you're doing this thing. You think of all the frigging kind of interconnections and what would happen. And then that thing happens, you know, mm. I'm sure the last thing they expected when the wolf was reintroduced into Yellowstone was that the river's courses would change. Right. I mean, it's just like, oh, okay, wait a bit. But then when you say it and you go, well, think about it, this to that, to this, to that. Mm -hmm. And this gets down into a, a very important element in alchemy, which is sort of the ethics and morals, mm -hmm. right? And a, a lot of the stuff that begins, it's like, it's, it's basically careful what you're doing here, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are some that get kind of explicit and don't work for kings or princes, <laughs> <laughs> right? It, it's probably not going to end up too good and right. probably not very karmically good for you either, you know, this kind of mm -hmm. a thing. And there are stories like that. Mm -hmm. But this idea of before doing something, and especially if you're doing something chemically or physically, is really visualizing and seeing uh, where this is, what that ripple is going to end up with, mm. right? Uh, there's, a, there's an alchemist, uh, Manfred Junius, who died in the early two, 2000s, um, who didn't do much work with mercury or heavy metals, although you know, he did stuff with it, uh, because he said it was just, he said, just too karmically risky, mm -hmm. meaning that it's a very poisonous material. And uh, where are you doing? How are you disposing of it? What, what, you know, you've got people living next to, you know, this type of a thing. It's like, okay, fine, you want to pursue this, but really, what are you pursuing? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's these ideas that are extraordinarily important. And um, I don't know how that came up in the cover, but it was in there and it was just right. something that, but it is, it is important because um, you'll see it alluded to, why is this kept secret, right? Mm -hmm. Why do, and this is, ties into some of the symbols as a matter of fact, why do you use, there's a line in a very early work of Zosimos and his partner Theosabia where she asks him, why do we always speak in mysteries? Why do we always use these weird terms? And he goes, well, two reasons. One, if we spoke it clearly, it would be only understood as glass making. Mm. And that becomes a really interesting hint as to what physical processes they were working. Mm -hmm. But the other one was meaning that this would just look like what we are doing would look as if it was just any other ordinary craft or any other art, whether it was gilding, glass making, or anything else. We're working with matter, but really what he's saying is we're working with matter philosophically. Not that they were really, and they call it philosophical gold, not because it's right. actual gold, it's the gold that comes out of this whole philosophical process. Yeah, isn't it and the you, you end up with, stone? Yeah, yeah, you mm. actually do. You actually will make a powder of projection. Mm. Um, that it won't transmute, transmute, but you know, it will, uh, if, you put, if you put this powder on copper and you heat the copper up, 
it will spread gold over it. Mm. The powder is gold, but that's another story. Yeah. But <laughs> it's but it's that whole process of getting there mm. is what it's about, right? Because right. the idea is that you're taking imperfect matter, you're bringing it through these stages to its a uh, 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 perfection which can be silver and that's one of the stages you can stop there and you just change this thing into silver it has no power but it's silver you could take it another stage and make it gold it doesn't really have any power but it's gold you take it to its fourth stage you've now taken what's perfect and now we can perfect so we can turn around and go do this so you see this on uh, on a material level that would be the philosopher's stone or the power of projection on a spiritual level, depends upon which which branch of whatever you belong to. It's a saint, a bodhisattva. Um, it's somebody who has a, a jiva muktan, someone who's achieved enlightenment in their own body. Uh, and here they are; they're able to turn around and you know, kind of do it, uh, as opposed to go, you know what? I'm good. I'm out of here. Where is where's the pearly gates? Let me in. You know, uh, someone getting there, going, you know what? I, 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 I got, uh, hold, hold my place. I got friends. I'll be back. You know, that kind of an idea. And that idea in a, in a spiritual sense is what's being implied in this material, mm -hmm. right? That that's what's going on. here. And um, to the symbol aspect of it, and this is what it's trying to show is there are these, it's, it's not so much kind of showing you a secret process, so to speak. It's showing you the changes mm. is, what I, is how I feel about it. And then you had to figure out, well, okay, if that's happening there, how, how, do, how do you do that with these materials? Um, so you find it both trying to reveal uh, when they make these things, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a way of exploring what you're doing and trying to verbalize the processes you're engaged in material, right? You, 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 for an example, just to kind of give it something concrete to hold on to, baking soda and vinegar, right? You put those together and you get this frothing and all this stuff. You used to make soda, vinegar rockets, this type of stuff, right? Well, we've all had basic high school chemistry and we go, oh, it's an acid and a volatile, you know, a, a salt that lets a lot of carbon dioxide loose. We have a language for it. We could describe it. We could reproduce it. We can do it. If you've never seen this before, how would you? What would you? How would you describe this? Well, it's something, and it's acidic, so it's something biting, burning, right? And then something that's just bitter and salty. But yet, when you put them together, there's this incredible violent reaction. Stuff happens, and then it's neither acid and it's neither bitter. It's this other thing. How do you explain that, right? So if you look at these alchemical images of two things kind of fusing into a half a two thing and then a one thing, um, you see it as this attempt to explain unification of opposites, mm. right? We can explain that in chemical terms. We could even explain that in biological terms. We could explain that in, you know, alchemy had one language and this was that of there are these systems. It seems to be working here. These two things come together. They get, they lose their individuality and a third comes. You know? well, we see that with mammals too, right? We see that here. So it becomes this kind of a universal principle of a unification of opposites. So that's what some of the alchemical imagery is doing. It's, it's stating its theory right, to others around, to edify as well as to show off, I know what I know, and so this is why you should do it. It's also uh, perhaps explaining a process, their process in a certain way, so that those who do know can try to do it. Um, it there's a lot of it that is very early science, you know, in that sense of like, hey, it, do what I do, what do you get? You got that, I got that. I mean, that's one of the basis of science, reproducibility. Again, it's dangerous knowledge. You don't want riffraff getting it. And this is what uh, Zosimos was also saying. You don't want people having this. In this case, you really can make things that look like gold, right? Most of the prohibitions against alchemy come from that fear of like counterfeit. Burn the mm -hmm. books. You're not going to let these folks have this, you know? 
Newton was made master of the mint because he knew all the tricks because he tried to make gold, right? And, you know, you end up with stuff that, I mean, I've made stuff, you know, it's, it's really a sophisticated form of depletion gilding. It's a technical process, nothing secret about it, except the early salts and the methods and the minerals you would use to do it. And that's it. You bring it through this process and it's like, wow, okay, I've just done what was said, mm. you know? But in that process, you're working. And here's the trick, right? The thing is, the more you work on something, where does it show up, right? It tends to show up in your sleep, in your dreams. Mm. And this is one of, the, this is one of the, the secrets of it. It's like once it starts showing up there, you start doing work there. If it happens to become lucid dream, it becomes even more interesting. And this is, a, it's not something kind of made up now. You know what I mean? Since we have kind of rediscovered this idea of lucid dreaming. Um, but this is something you'll find in, in, the, in the alchemical text, alluded to or referenced in one way or another. It's like that you can interpret it meaning other things, but the other things are just as interesting as this thing, right? Such as, uh, again, Zosimos is trying to explain a process to his uh, partner and says, I'm not quite getting it. And he goes, well, join me in a vision. And she's like, well, how do we do that in daytime? And he starts making references to uh, some hermetic text that actually has this idea of calming the passions, withdrawing the senses, all these kinds of things. And he goes, well, when we're there, don't speak, right? Just, we'll see. It, there's, you, there's a lot within there that starts pointing. Uh, the idea of working with matter on the outside, this was the... Uh, like I use the example of geometry in this way, right? Uh, where it is a material practice on the outside, you know, like it's more of surveying than anything else, but it is a material practice to do certain things. And for the Greeks, Greek philosophers, Aristotle, all of them, geometry was a way of purifying the, the, the mind's eye, right? Yeah, didn't it way, Plato, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, if you do this, you, you actually start seeing it in your mind's eye. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the interesting thing about that is that a geometrical form triangle, it's like a dream, mm. right? In, in the sense that it has a concreteness to it, but it's not real, mm -hmm. right? There's, but yet it, not unlike a dream, it follows very distinct and very, very strict rules as to what it can do and what it can't do. Mm -hmm. But once you can start playing with that in your head, Right? It opens up a whole nother world. And this is, what, this is what you see in the theurgic kind of material, which is where a lot of the alchemy starts to come from and the inner alchemy comes from. Right. Um, yeah, because that's something I wanted to ask you about as well, because I know uh, we haven't really talked much about the history of it, um, yeah. but I know that alchemy is deeply connected with hermeticism and Absolutely. I think Gnosticism yes, all and of it. It, it, the Western esoteric and the magical traditions as well. Right. As it yeah. kind of in various periods of that tradition, how it right. erupts right. into it and how it's sure. understood. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But that's, that's it. Like a, just a brief outline. I mean, it does, what we would call alchemy, this idea of something being able to be transmuted, whether it is a philosophical gold or the idea of actual transmutation, um, really does have its West, like the West has its origins in Alexandria, the, the, the greco roman You don't really find much talking about metallic transmutation and what little there is in ancient Egypt, right? They're master metallurgists, but you don't get a sense that they're believing that they're changing one metal into another. Mm -hmm. right? It's just like they know what they're doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? They are masters at it. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if like that technology and spiritual practice, whatever was remnant in, you know, like 200 AD, 200 AD what have you, uh, in terms of uh, authentic Egyptian religious practice. But you also have the influx of, of Platonic thought, with the, but more Neoplatonic. And then you have the writings of Hermes, you know, which seems to be sort of this authentic blend around 200, 300 BC of, of quasi-Egyptian Greek merging <laughs> writings and stuff. Yeah. 
But all of this has uh, a root in alchemy. I mean, alchemy has its roots in this. So it's it's sort of like a metallurgy out of Egypt. Um, uh, uh, this syncretic philosophy evolving out of that through the Greek Neoplatonic and its own whatever visionary kind of thing that comes out from whoever's living there, if you know what I mean, that's lost, you know, whose name is lost, but yet kind of move things along. Um, but I would say for alchemy, one of the things is, is uh, this idea of theurgy. Um, and particularly uh, Iamblichus, uh, because he was more working with uh, matter, right? He was saying that the divine is everywhere. It's, it's imminent in everything. And the idea that, well, remember how the gods used to walk with us? Remember all those stories? Some would be walking here and Hermes would show up. How come that ain't happening no more, right? How come no one believes this? Uh, you know, God had become this, you know, totally separate, transcendent being, uh, over the over the period of time within sort of Greek thought, and uh, and Plotinus is a Neoplatonist. They're all attempting to unify and ascend to the one and be you know, this type of a thing. And Plotinus is more, as I like to think of a of a Zen approach to stuff. He he's just like it's almost mind only. You know, how do you how do you achieve all this? He says is just cut everything away. Whereas the Amblicus is like. Well, no, the divine is imminent in everything. And if we can assemble this by making statues, what have you, we open up a channel. And by opening up this channel, we can begin this ascent. And the channel is by connecting with the various gods, deities, or what have you. But it's this idea of assembly, of like bringing material together. And this is where it relates to this idea of, of symbols. Right, because this is what it's like. Alchemy is viewed as that. It's kind of bringing matter together, but they view matter as as symbolic as well. It's a symbolic of its own being. This is going to get trippy, but we'll kind of <laughs> slow down here. Um, and this is what it's trying to do. This idea of everything is interconnected, right? So. Say you're working, you're you're making a talisman, you're making a symbol that involves uh, Apollo, let's say, right? The energies of Apollo. They view the world as okay, let's just say an energy of Apollo, which is like the sun. But if if you think of it as a particular, I hate using this word because it's so friggin' vague, an energy of, of mm -hmm. what have you, but just think of a solar energy, whatever that might mean to you, right? And what they, would, what they would see is that energy on a plant level would show up or manifest as a sunflower, right? In the animal world, it would show up as a rooster or the lion. In the planetary realm, it would show up as the sun. In the mythic realm, it would show up as Apollo, right? So the deeper sense of it is there's this something else that has this quality, but when it interacts with these various fields of creation and manifestation, that energy manifests in a certain way, right? So the planetary, it's the sun. In the earth, it's gold, right? In the human body, it's the heart. So this is how it sees this sort of interconnection. So what Iamblichus is saying and alchemy is saying is that if you bring enough stuff together, right? It's like sulfur wanting the flame, as he says. It's like it's enough to cause that spark to come. And with that, you've animated a statue, you, you bought this thing into its other thing. And at that point, whatever mystical, magical work you're doing is now accessible. But it's that's the sort of the, how the material and that philosophical, uh, theological sort of intersection happens. And out of that comes alchemy, right? And then that takes off on its own as a practice, as a thing. And then by third, fourth century, uh, this is an, this is a, a sort of, it seems as if it's an established Greco-Roman practice. There's enough folks writing about it and doing it. And then by about sixth century, um, it's, it's occurring in, uh, in Constantinople. There's a writer, Stephanos of Alexandria. He's writing in like the six thirties or something. Um, and he's compiling all this information about alchemy. You know, and this is where he says, this is what it is. You must study all ways of knowing. 
This is what the philosopher does. And then through mystic words and actions, one starts to understand the unity, right? And that's, it's like, well, that's it, you know? But it, 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 that's where it really kind of, you see all aspects of this alchemy together. Now, the, yeah. could I just, just yeah, a please. little into yeah, Islam? Please. Because this is where there's a little twist here because it all sounds so yeah. beautiful and mystical right. and like, oh my God, this is incredible. Right. Well, what happens is that around 700 AD, right, there were these uh, attacks from the Arab world to take Constantinople. And, uh, well, Constantinople had this thing called Greek fire uh, and they incinerated the Arab fleet in mm. um, harbor of Marmor and whatever, seven, what have you. Um, and so then they tried it again a little bit later and their fleet was incinerated a second time. And so uh, 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 emissary was sent to Constantinople and this is documented, his report back to, I forget who the Abbasid was. Uh, and it reports on what's going on in Disney because the king showed us, right? They have these bags full of this powder. If you take a pinch of it, it turns this into gold. And as the king says, that's the source of our wealth. And he looks down the hall and there's bags upon bags upon bags. And one pinch of this turns like two pounds of lead into two pounds of gold. So the, he goes back to Baghdad and goes, holy shit, they not only have Greek fire, but they know how to make gold. And this is true. The school, there were these institutions called um, Bayit al-Hikmah, Houses of Wisdom. And the whole purpose of this was to get all of Greek science and translate it into Arabic. And so it was like a beginning of an arms race in a sense. So it's not always this sort of, you know, pure research, spirituality and things and, and stuff. There is this real material recognition that there's some knowledge here that can be used in the pursuit of power, right? This is what the alchemists feared, that this would not be used for pursuit of wisdom or healing. It would be used for pursuit of power and that can be dangerous. That's why, that's one of the reasons for symbols. Yeah. Well, I wonder if the translation of all these Greek texts into Arabic, I know that I always tell students that we owe Islam a huge Absolutely. debt this is... of gratitude because they're the ones who preserved, you know, exactly. math and the Greek philosophy. And so it would have been at that time, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. It. Yeah. That, that is where it comes from Greek, from the Byzantine into, into Arabic, into Islam. Uh -huh. okay. And then once it goes there, it really takes off because mm -hmm. they take knowledge seriously. Right. And then, there's also like, wow, you know, there's a whole mystic dimension mm -hmm. of this, mm -hmm. which gets, you know, I mean, my God, we're perfecting this. Well, of course, look, we are able to perfect things. Mm -hmm. So let's work here. You know what I mean? Come, yeah. <laughs> let's do yeah. a, let's do a remembrance, you know? Um, so it, it ha and then it develops, but it's also the medicine. This is the mm -hmm. other thing is that right. is of like, in almost all of this, it's the pursuit of that. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the gold is really important. Um, but it's constantly, you know, kind of like probing for how this does. And that's a very interesting thing to trace uh, because you do follow, um, you do follow the, the discoveries of medicines and the entry of alcohol, for instance. Right. right? That's like through Sicily, 12th century, right? And uh, came in through the Arabs and two, two doctors are there. It's like, holy shit, what's this? <laughs> you know, they, right. what does this do? And this is the elixir. This is the quintessence and um, changes everything. Right. And that becomes a secret knowledge. How do you get yeah. the quintessence? You know? Right. Uh, um, I, I, let's, I want to talk to you about yeah, the yeah, medicine, sure. but I do have uh, a question in regards to the sort of the spread of alchemy. I also mm -hmm. know that there's an alchemical tradition in India. Oh, yeah. And yeah. there was also one in, in China. Oh, uh, yes. Yep. And, yeah, in Tibet as well. Tibet. Mm -hmm. Did they have the common source, do you know? Or was it something that emerged kind of within those cultures? My feeling is, is that they emerged in their own proto ways, okay. right? Because it's just humans interacting with matter, trying to make matter do what it wants, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're 
forging, you know, arrowheads or, you right. know, swords, what have you. Right. There comes a common reaction to the materials you're working with. So through metallurgy, I think. Yeah, so Iliana, there is a, yeah. yeah, there is a, um, there is a sort of a direct kind of experience we have with it. So I feel mm -hmm. that at, at source, it's individual cultures kind of interacting and coming to ways of understanding things. Mm -hmm. And then there are the transmissions that go on because, you know, I mean, once the Silk Route gets up and running, uh, I mean, it's like, okay, who's, and then the fact that, uh, you know, Alexander the Great made it to, you know, to, to, to what is Afghanistan, the whole Gandharvan culture. Um, I mean, that's like, you know, our, the images of Buddha were never images before Alexander. It was just the eight auspicious and it's, uh, you know, God Apollo, that is the, the image they took from it. And this is 300 BC, right? Um, so it's, you know, there is, there is that, you know, uh, there is a great deal of similarity, but at the same time, um, just the metals and the materials that are being worked with. Mm -hmm. mercury and sulfur that's i want to want to say that's everywhere but that's everywhere I mean, throughout europe you can find it um and they're both strange materials that do strange things and are very useful and so there is an independence to it but there's also as it goes on it's hard to say there's no there's no cross ideas it it, it, it becomes really hard to say that there is a, um, in John Needham, Civil Science and Civilization in China, he has like three, three volumes dealing with alchemy in China. Mm -hmm. And he discovered a text um, that is very early, but parallels uh, the Emerald Tablet. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, he, he's not, you know, I'm not claiming this is the source. I'm not mm -hmm. claiming that who's saying from where, we don't have mm -hmm. real kind of firm dates on any of this, but, Take a look, folks. What do you think? Yeah. You know, and there's the language. Right. At the same time, it's the language of like if you sit at and look at the world, you go, "Oh, water evaporates; it condenses; it comes down." You know, mm -hmm. you, know uh, you know, cows and bulls get together; they make baby cows. You know what I mean? There's there's a kind of a commonality that where it draws from. Right. And so I think at heart, there's a lot of that that still remains. Mm -hmm. right? that has its power because of that. There's something kind of almost primal about some of these things that's played with within alchemy, right? And which I do think adds to a sort of a power of some of these images that they do touch on stuff that we think we know, but we can't, we don't have a language for. Right? Okay. And again, as I was saying, sometimes intentional, sometimes that's just the nature of a living symbol. It comes there and you know it's trying to tell you something. Yeah, right. yeah I was thinking, uh, you know, when you were talking about the secret sort of esoteric aspect of it and the insistence mm -hmm. that, you know, this has to be kind of secret, I was thinking that it was um, tantric chemistry um, because, well, yes. yeah, you know, all of that had to be kept secret too. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Because it's like, why? Because people will misunderstand, mm -hmm. right? It was, I remember speaking once with a Mahayana, a Tibetan Buddhist monk, right? Again, about secrecy and things mm -hmm. like this. And it's like, well, how come, you know, the whole idea of emptiness and these things? And he goes, he goes, well, honestly, it was, I mean, now it's all open. Everybody talks about it because, you know, it's like those who will understand will really understand. And it's like those who will don't, you just, you don't have to worry about it. They just mm -hmm. won't understand. But what he was saying is that, um, it really could be misunderstood that it's like, well, nothing matters, mm. right? And he goes, and that's a really dangerous idea to put to people's heads, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. So when you understand what that means, what the nuances of what this means is, no, it's not like nothing matters. <laughs> you right. know? There's a whole, there's a whole other, it gets deep, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it is, but you see the, it, you see the legitimacy for that. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the legitimacy, you know, why I won't necessarily, you know, put out recipes on how to make contact explosives. Right. Do you know what I mean? It's like, why would I do that? You know what yeah. I mean? Anybody with a chemistry degree can do that. But mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? There's like, no, you don't do that. Right, <laughs> it's right, like, you don't know right. who's going to do that. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the uh, Emerald Tablet. 
and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's the uh, community college professor in me that I always uh, don't want to assume that people know oh, absolutely what these things can. are. So uh, I was wondering if you could maybe say a few words on what the Emerald Tablet is. And I know that you did a translation of it. Yes. Yeah. And I had a question in regards to the translation, because oh, I think that one of the other ways that people know of alchemy, and they may not know that it's alchemy, is with the uh, phrase from the Emerald Tablet of oh, as yes. above, so below. Absolutely. But you give a little bit of a different translation to that. No, um, I give an accurate translation. Yeah. So I wanted to ask the, you. That's what the, that's what those words say. Yeah. Okay. So let me just, let me just give an overview because mm -hmm. the thing is um, the reason just in a, there are different versions of it that exist from a very early period of time. So here's what, here's, here's the story. There are many stories, but here's like the main themes of it is that at one point there's uh, Apollonius of Tyana, right? He's one of these great, he's like a contemporary counterpart of Jesus or the pagan Jesus is how some people put him. <laughs> and he used to go by, you know, in this market square a statue and it's and it was standing on something and it said beneath me is the truth right and it was like well of course it's one of these things it's beneath me is the truth right it's like you're standing on a book that's what it is something like that and then there's an earthquake one day and he passes by the square and he sees that this thing is cracked open from the earthquake and there's cold air coming out and he's like oh okay and he kind of just there's stairways down and he goes down and in the bottom of it is a statue of hermes and he's holding this tablet in his hands, right? And it's a 13 line sort of poem that describes and explains the creation of the universe, right? What creative forces are there? And it starts out with, this is true, no doubt. And typically what the first lines are, what most people have heard and how it is almost always translated is, uh, the above is like the below, the below is like the above in the ways of doing things. This is how it all unfolds. So I just in part of my research, I kind of try to find the earliest sources of things. What's the first, what's the first, what's the first? So I found the Latin version, which was from and uh, translated from an Arabic book. And this is one of the rare instances where both of those are still in existence. Right. And in the back of that, and these are the earliest, right? This is, these are the earliest versions of it. The one in the Arabic is from around 8th century AD. Right? That's the, there, there's, there's definitely something earlier because there's indications in there that it is from Greek because there's Arabicized Greek words in there. And then so many years later, uh, that book with the Emerald Tablet was translated into Latin, right? And then that off went, it, it went off its way. And then no doubt somewhere along the line, someone else came across an Arabic uh, version of uh, the Emerald Tablet and then translated that into Latin. Now, some of the things that happened, well, before I get to that, uh, so the Arabic version in here has this idea of that the, the first line is the above comes from the below and the below comes from the above. So what image this sets up immediately, or what it's describing immediately is this circulation, this unending circulation. And this is what, it does fit in with a hermetic worldview of like the world constantly creating, destroying, creating, destroying these, these sorts of things that are going on all the time, right? So this is one of the dynamic creative processes of the universe. And so it, it fits in. And so, and that is exactly what it says, because uh, my understanding has always been as, as, as. Um, I, I, w I studied Latin for, for several years, I had, had it work with tutors. And as I'm translating this, I'm saying this really does say from, and he's like, yep, it does. That's exactly what it says. And it's like, okay. And as I was doing the Arabic, um, studied that for you and then worked with the tutor, came up, you know, did the translation. And I said, it really says that? And he says, yeah, that's what it is. Min, it means from. It's like, it's 
there's, there's no other. I said, what's as or like? And he goes, well, that would be ka or, 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 or you know, the, there's another uh, possible preposition that would be used, but not, no, this is from. It means it came from there. I came from here. He came from here. Because that's what it's used as. Minwenintha, you know? where are you from? Um, this kind of an idea. So that was like a, a kind of an eye-opening kind of an understanding because it was no longer just a simile. It was no longer a metaphor. It was actually describing a physical process, right? This is coming, this is a circulation. And knowing that circulation in practical alchemy is alchemy. If there's no circulation, you're probably not doing alchemy. And at that time, exactly at that time, as I'm working on the translations, I'm giving some workshops on very basic alchemy, distillation, these sorts of things. And I'm trying to find something I call urban alchemy. Like, what can you do in your kitchen in a, in a tiny New York City apartment, but you still want to experiment, these kinds of things. And there's a, there's a circulation device uh, from like the 15th century that it's just a jar with a cone in it, right? And the idea of circulation is something heats, heats, heats a cool thing, it condenses and drops back down, reheats. It's like percolation. If you put coffee in there, you, yeah. So it's this, so I was experimenting with like something really easy somebody can do at home, right? Get a martini glass, cut the bottom off, put it in this jar, heat it up, put ice in the top. And so I'm watching this, I'm, 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 this is literal. I'm, I'm at a table, I'm working on translations. I, I already realized it's saying from, 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 this is, I'm like, this is really cool because it kind of lines up with this. I get up to go check on this circulation thing. Is it going, is it happening? And it's like, yeah. And I'm looking around the sort of condensation zone. It's an area that's really, really sort of cold. And I'm noticing like a little, haze it's it's cloudy and i'm like that's really cool and it's like then i noticed there are these little droplets coming down right? it's like raining pure alcohol and i literally said to myself where's that coming from and i was like oh it's holy shit it's coming from below here's a circulation device that parallels very much what they were using in, in a karatakis a karatakis device and it's, the de it's a demonstration of that principle right here. The above comes from the below. It's no weird kind of, you know, oh my God, how can they say that the divine comes from down here? That's evil. You know, no, this is, this is the creation of the cosmos. Um, so this is, this is where experimentation or doing things will lead to an insight into what the text is saying. Right? And then experimentally, it might suggest a different avenue to go down. Right? So this is, this is what the Emerald Tablet, it describes a, a circulation and it describes a sort of an oscillation. In other words, that there's a, comb there's a unification of opposites that this third thing arises from. And then the other key concept in it is that not only is this the way the universe is made, this is the way the work is done. Right? So whatever patterns are there, but drawing that out further, it's also saying how everything is created, any creative act, right? And that's where this is like the, as I said, the, the, the intersection where some of my interests are is in that, is in how any creative act starts to mimic sort of alchemical processes in this way. And so that's something I've been kind of thinking about and, and, and exploring. And it's something for a way for people who are interested in alchemy and involved in art or making of anything to start to engage in alchemical thought, right? In, especially in the sense of stuff moving inward, having a dialogue with the material, having a dialogue with your creation. And this is what alchemy is. It's like, what's going on in the flask? Yeah, you is, hear alchemists going, isn't that exactly what's, you know? Yeah. Is that what you mean in the, uh, on the back of alchemy, the poetry of matter, uh, it says, it's an alchemical book rather than yeah. a book about alchemy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are things and it, it, it asks you to engage. It asks mm -hmm. you to, it's not so much like, I don't know, puzzles, although there mm -hmm. might be some. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, right. it's just the kind of thing where I'm not, I'm not writing historically, even though I am pulling recipes, I am pulling right. things, facts and stuff. But it, but it really is like 
I mean, it's it's what I yeah, it's alchemy. Yeah. I, I you know. Yeah. Well, read it, gives, it. It's fun. Yeah, yeah, it's a good book. Yeah, and yeah. and I did want to congratulate you on your books. Uh, you know, I've read a few books on alchemy, and uh, I found Practical Alchemy to be a really good introduction. To Practical uh, Alchemy. And, yeah, it is. That's the and, idea. Uh, and the poetry of matter was uh, very fun to read, and in both of them. Uh, I'm very grateful for the bibliography, the oh, reading yeah. list that you yeah, provided. Yeah. Uh, I think that's an outstanding resource for uh, future reading. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the whole, yeah. quite honestly, I wrote the books so I can get a bibliography out there. Ah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm only half joking there. Yeah. For me, it's like, if you know, it's like, if you ever check out any of my zines, if you've ever come to a talk of mine, the first thing I start with, first slide, bibliography. Mm. Here, if you're inter if you've, uh, basically I'll show the first slide, here's the bibliography. If you've come for this, you can go now. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, because I know it's like, it's like, I know, I know what you're talking about. I've heard this, I've studied this. What are your sources? Yeah. You know, what do you, where would you go? And that's what it is. I know people when they come to talks, when they come to this material, I know when I open up a book, first place I go to, hmm. bibliography, table of contents, and maybe two or three key words to see if you touched on that topic, right? And then I go, okay, let me go. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if not, well, okay. And so that's it. And to me, it's all about trailheads is the way I think about it, mm -hmm. right? Like just yeah. providing people, I've done most of this work. I've not done all of it, but here's my framework. If I were to continue on, if I don't, well, here, you shall carry the flag forward. Here's, right. here's some of the key things, key text. You know? Yeah, I, I like the idea with uh, working with the art uh, and other forms. I know color plays a large part in this and yeah. music, I think. It seems like you're giving or suggesting that there is other work that people can do. Mm -hmm. for this alchemical process rather than just setting exactly. up a laboratory in their homes. Exactly right. right. Yeah. What, I, what I'm saying is, or what I've come to understand is that you certainly can do that. Mm -hmm. What I found is that doing the laboratory work gave insight into the texts, which has given me insight into what I feel are some of these inner processes, like I'm talking like say dream work, lucid dreaming. The thing is when you start having these things and you're doing it, stuff starts to happen in the dream that you're not necessarily expecting, right? Mm -hmm. Traditional idea of working with dream and alchemy and stuff is interpreting the dream, which is important. You will get meaning from it, sometimes direct indications as to what comes next but also alchemical and perhaps more so are the dreams that point you inward, right? That start to say like, okay, you're almost in the underworld, but you got a little ways to go, come this way, or here's a way, or maybe consider this, you know? And you will have these experiences very clearly, very disturbingly sometimes, and it'd be like, okay, you know, that's an insight in. And when you then you read, some of the Neoplatonic texts and, you know, the, the idea of um, the diamond, you know, sort of this intermediary spirit that we have, you know, okay, is this what they're speaking about, right? Some other, not out of body experience, woo-woo stuff like that, but just an, another sense of being in a sense, right? That, so you will find this, and especially in the earlier alchemy, right? That has still some of that theurgic flavor where they are talking about this, this kind of in, uh, inner process. But the point is, it's that matter, it's that material thing. Another concrete example of this is iconography in an Orthodox Christian tradition, and no doubt in other ones too, but this is one I'm familiar with. It's by working on that image that is the image of your soul, right? And that I was informed that the icon that you're writing um, is both a window into the divine as well as a mirror into your soul. Right? What your practice is, is to become more like that thing on the other side and less like the thing on this side. And that through this meditation of using matter as that support. Um, I once did, there's an Orthodox cathedral near where I live and they had an icon studio in the basement and they would give open studio. So I went and, and did this because of the parallels with what I was studying. And it's remarkable. 
right? I mean, the first lines out of the mouth is like, we use the materials of art, but it's not art. And it's like, well, what do you mean? It's like, no, this is a spiritual practice. We use, the, we use this as a prop. We stand on this. This brings us, it's like, yeah, this is alchemy. Oh, man, we got into some really good discussions. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, because of that underpinning of this idea of matter is not evil, mm. right? It's, you know, and there are some, there are some really early like church fathers that actually will come around and say that, even yeah. though later on in the church, it's like, oh, you know, you know, <laughs> it's like beat the body. It's all bad. <laughs> and it's like, no, no, no. How could, how could matter be evil? It has its share in the divine. The creator right. created it. It's right. like, well, come on guys, slow down here. Yeah. heading into blasphemy land you know this kind of thing yeah yeah uh, that's one of the ways that pan got associated with the devil is yeah. when uh, yeah. nature started to be seen as uh evil Ooh. right yeah, yeah. Uh, and now i love the the material aspect and i think it's important i was trying to find in my uh, notes here i know that at one point you wrote that this work is it starts in nature. Yeah. And um, I don't see where I wrote down the actual uh, quote, but mm -hmm. I, I, I feel that that's so important right now um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of our current moment in our current uh, environmental situation. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that we have to have a spirituality that's part of that. Yes. Um, and we have to work with the matter. We can't have the material world being seen as evil anymore right or something just to manipulate to our own right pleasurable ends without any yeah. any 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 consideration of like okay and then yeah, yeah. You know? when it also seems fairly alchemical that you know we are you know it's not the above and the below but it's the within and the without oh yes Yes. And that also you will, again, in, in speaking to some Tibetan monks about this, I was saying about the above and below, and they were like, oh, this is very interesting. We have the within and without. And it's like, oh, same thing. And, you know, that is also implied within there, but in the, uh, in the Western, but it's, it's, it's here, there's an image mm -hmm. in, from this book called The Splendor Solace. And it's a, it's an image of a character that is two-headed in, in its, um, in its left hand, it's yeah, it's holding an egg, and in its right hand, it's displaying a, a, what looks like a shield. And uh, what the shield is is really the a picture of the earth right below the moon. So it's earth, water, air, fire, and that's what it's holding. And then in this other hand, it's holding an egg. And what the text is about um, is how the egg is also the five elements with the quintessence also. It symbolizes the beginning of the work in terms of matter. It also symbolizes the end of the work. But what's also being displayed is it's defining its cosmology, right? So here in the shield, it's saying that, and it says it explicitly in the text, right? The idea that earth is like a shell, right? In, in alchemy, earth represents the structure, shell, form, water is what makes things bend fluid air what makes it float or you know kind of fire what gives it life heat these sorts of things right so with the shield it starts with earth water air fire and then goes out to the ether right to the quintessence and the shell is just the opposite it starts with the earth right water air fire and then in its center is the quintessence symbol which is the uh, the embryo i guess so what this image is showing or displaying is that our existence, our material existence is just this thin, 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 foamy film between two eternities, right? Between two quintessences, right? So you could start where you are here on the material thing and you can quote unquote ascend and you would ascend through earth, water, air, fire, quint you know, and so on and so forth to the one. And the same with alchemy, you can just, you can descend, and this is another way I define alchemy is it's ascent through descent, right? By descending into matter and going, what's, what's next? What's next? What's next? After a point, it just opens up to another eternity in a sense. So this is, um, you know, this is part of, I don't know where that started. I don't know where that <laughs> ended up, but somehow 
I had to say it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's important, and yeah. and I I, I like it's, the, it's world view is what it yeah. is. Yeah. Well, and I like the the sort of cosmology that you write about. So there is that connection, um, the flow between the above mm-hmm. and the below. Everything is linked. Yeah. And it's also a symbolic right. cosmos. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, where I live, it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it. I'll have to come visit sometime. <laughs> you should. You should. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know we're, uh, we've are we been at this for a while. I wanted to ask you uh, one last thing about the medicine. Uh, I kind of want to go back to the medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because I know one of the things you do write about is that it's not just in the laboratory settings. It's not just working with minerals and stones, but also with plants. Of course. Uh, and so you can develop tinctures and then those can be mm-hmm. used for medicinal purposes. Right. Right. Yeah. So the idea there is, 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 is exactly what you just said, um, that what you would find has you would, for the most part, use a plant as a medicinally. You would then give it a uh, extract a tincture from it, its salts, these types of things, and then make an alchemical tincture. And the idea of which is it has all the components in it and it's uh, more potent. That's the idea. I don't want to get into how to make it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like yeah. buy the book. Yeah. Practical yeah. Alchemy gives all the recipes. But the reason why and one of the benefits of uh, working with plants is that, well, first of all, unless you're working with explicitly poisonous plants, you're a lot safer experimenting and learning alchemical theory through the practice uh, because distillation, circulation, calcination, different degrees if you're working with metals uh, or plants, but it's safer processes working with plants. The alchemy or the alchemical techniques necessary to actually do some basic work with plants, it's nothing different than you would really find in a kitchen. So it's the same dangers. And as we all know, that's really dangerous in the kitchen. Uh, But if you approach it with a sort of a mindful, careful attitude and knowing like kind of run it in your mind a few times what's going on, it's nothing, it's nothing extra special spooky. It's nothing you haven't done before, right? Uh, but the benefit of it is, is that you start interacting with material. You start seeing what goes on. It's like it gets a little playful and that's okay. Um, you can end up with some good medicinal tinctures. They were also used um, in what was like a more of an initiatic sense. Uh, in the sense that you would to harmonize those parts of your soul, body, what have you, with whatever planetary forces. And since everything is interconnected, right, if you wanted to do some stuff with, uh, not like you're treating the heart, it's, it's more of a meditation on the heart with a prop, let's say. Uh, although because it is an herb with impact on the heart, it does have an impact on the heart, right? So. So something like a, a tincture made with St. John's wort, right? You would take a few drops of that on a Sunday morning at sunrise. And so you see the connections here. It's like this whole kind of solar heart thing kind of going on. And the idea would be is that this would start to accustom you. You would start to, as a practice, you would have this daily meditation, kind of like considering or, or feeling that kind of going through your body. And this parallels very strongly with some of the Eastern techniques of um, some of the tantric uh, work where there are the precious pills that will be taken as a drop and then taken and then you visualize it moving through the channels, activating the channels. It's a very strong parallel. At the same time, I, I, I can also understand those things being discovered independently. You know, if you've ever taken something and felt it go all the way down in that sense, if you know what I mean. Um, so it does have that both medicinal, but then also this idea of, and this goes to another writer from the Renaissance, Marsilio Ficino, and in his, uh, three books on, uh, on medicine, on life, in his third book, he gives all these processes for harmonizing yourself with the planet. I mean, he's not talking magic. Because he keeps saying, it's like, well, as you go out into the sun to get some nice, healthy sun rays, you know, you will step out and do these things to draw the rays of Venus into you, you know. Don't worry, we're not doing magic here. Don't, nothing, nothing for you guys to look at. 
there are sometimes I read him and I always, always, always say this is like, how come they didn't burn him? Yeah. You know? But he, but he, he, you know, he's somebody very interesting to read on image mm. because there's a set there's, and I think I know I do, it's in my book where he says, um, it's safer for us to work with sort of powders basically alchemical materials when we're doing stuff than working with images and trying to create healing. And the sense, and I think he says is like, you know, cause we know they're powerful, but we don't really know why. Hmm. And this is like, there's, there, there's something I feel with that saying, it's almost on, a, on, on about the stepping off of like a, a semiotics in a way the, of knowing that there's something going on with signs right that he's feeling a power coming through there but doesn't know why right now with those minds it was good spirit evil spirit but to me it's like no we you know where does where does the power of an image come from really stop and take that apart i i don't know if we started having language to really meaningfully try to talk about that until late 19th early 20th century like with some linguistic ideas or, or you know what i mean and yeah. when i read these things he's like no he's not being he is actually feeling that these images and not necessarily from like a you know, spooky demon kind of a thing but he really doesn't know so you know what <laughs> we're safer not to go there these medicinal powders are more powerful mm. right and this is something he says in his book but um but that idea of working with these herbal materials to harmonize the geometry of the soul, that's the book to read because nobody really talks about it. Mm. Right? He's the one that actually, I often consider him as the operator's manual. The other ones will kind of indicate how to make things, but he actually starts to talk about it. And it's his writings that I see trying to harmonize what goes on psychically, bodily with the cosmos really parallels with some, uh, particularly some of the Buddhist tantras. And I'm also thinking like of the Kali Chakra Tantra right. um, that really has an elaborate cosmology, both outward and inward. And then how these things line up, it gets like, you know, but then yeah. again, everybody, humans, I think are always wanting to find the grand unified theory. Yeah. Right. And I think once you start describing something as fire, or earth, water, you can start finding those parallels and then you start to find the links. And then once you have the links, you think you have some, or you do have some sort of control ability with it, uh, these kinds of things. Right. Um, anyway, it's deep. Yeah. 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 When uh, you were talking about the, uh, the artistic creation, I was thinking of the mandalas and I yes. specifically, I was thinking of the Kali chakra mandala. Um, and uh, one of the last things I'll say is that you also write in the book that the purpose of doing all of this work is to end suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And for everyone to end suffering. That's it. All yeah, abs yeah, absolutely. I mean, what else? Right. You do that and that's one big party. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. It's like, yeah. who wants to party when you're not feeling good? Yeah. Right. I don't want to go out tonight. I don't feel well. <laughs> we had suffering. Woo yeah, you know. Right. See, everybody thinks it's from this high spiritual sense. No, nah, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's end suffering so we can party. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Brian, but it really is the point. It really yeah. is the point. But thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, speaking with you this afternoon. Me too. And um, uh, where can people go to find out more about you and your work? Oh, yes. Plug away. Um, uh, I have a website, uh, kepripress.com, and it's spelled K-H-E-P-R-I, Kepri, press, like a press.com. I have a website. Um, if you sign up for the list, I don't publicize the talks I do through my website. I just do whatever books or zines I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a sign up uh, form at the bottom if you want to sign up for the list where I will send out announcements and I only send out announcements dealing with I've just done a new zine or a book or I have some talks coming up I I, I don't have time for, for anything else well, um, I'll, 
I'll put the link for uh, Kepri Press in the uh, show notes and in oh, the great. Uh, yeah, video yeah. description on YouTube as well. Oh, that'd be great. That'd yeah, be very, yeah. very helpful. Yeah, and absolutely. This has been really good. I've really enjoyed speaking with you, man. Yes, well, I and enjoyed it Could you too. find yourself in New York City for real? Give me a shout. We'll go have a coffee and just Wonderful. continue on on a, you know, yeah, unrecorded yeah. basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully Slip we will. some recipes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, hopefully we can speak again. I would enjoy yeah, that yeah, very much. Yeah. Anytime. All right. Anytime. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. You have a good night. All right. You too. And that's a wrap on episode 17 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive review on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. Your reviews really are a tremendous help. And please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. Now, I know I always say that I will be releasing episodes every other week, but I have been releasing them every week as much as I can. Uh, And I'd like to continue that. I'm also working on creating additional video content for the YouTube channel including book reviews, educational videos, and topics concerning spirituality, the history of religion, and the religious response to the climate crisis. If you would like to support my work in creating free and hopefully credible material on YouTube, please consider making a one-time donation via PayPal. Creating these podcasts and video content takes a lot of time and a lot of work. Your support makes this possible. You can find a link for PayPal in the video description or show notes. Again, your support makes this podcast possible. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.